Hey, and welcome to the lecture. Before we jump into the learning, just a quick reminder to check out the workbooks available on modernoptician.com through the Ultimate Apprentice Optician Study Guide or available on Amazon worldwide. It's the best way to accompany this lecture so that you can fill in the blanks, label the diagrams, do everything all concurrently and elevate your training to the next level. All the links to the workbooks and the website are all in the description down below, so make sure to check it out. Other than that, enjoy today's lesson. All right, here we go. Time to talk about the extraocular muscles. So to this point, we've talked about lots of things about ocular anatomy. We've talked about the structures of the globe itself. We've talked about a little bit of the adnexa, the parts surrounding the eye, ball itself, we've talked about the lids, the lashes. We've talked about a few of those other things. Now it's time to talk about the muscles that move the eye around, the extraocular muscles. So in the lecture about the bony orbit, we already talked about a little bit how the muscles attach to certain parts uh, around that bony orbit. Now we're going to look at the muscles in particular. Now, the thing is about the muscles is that this can get a little bit complicated as far as understanding what each muscle does. Uh, one, one pulls, the other one relaxes. Uh, there's actually six extraocular muscles that allow the eye to move in all its cardinal movements and then everything in between as well. We'll talk a little bit more in detail in a few seconds. But I want you to, like many of the lectures in here, just kind of pay attention to the fact that there are multiple muscles and their exact function is important, but not in our day-to-day -day kind of stuff. It just helps us understand how everything works. And again, it's another one of those things that it's handy to know the terms if you're ever in a conversation with another professional, but you're not going to be assessing um, specific muscle movements. When we get into more advanced techniques as far as screening uh, for uh, proper eye movement and proper saccades and things like that, which we will discuss in more detail, Understanding how the eye is supposed to move is important, but the exact action of each muscle is less important. But we're still going to go over it just so that we have a little bit of background. So let's jump in. So let's take a look here at a diagram. I'm going to pull out my handy pen, I believe. Yeah, let's do a pen so that I can start marking off some of these things here. So you're going to notice here that the Every muscle in here is color co coordinated uh, and it's matching up with its particular title. The one thing I want to draw attention to here, and actually I'm going to highlight it here. We're going to highlight the levator palpebro superioris. That's the one we talked about in the eyelid section. That is actually not really an extraocular muscle. This is a muscle specifically designed to lift the upper eyelid. <clears throat> However, you can see here that it's attached very close to all the other muscles. So that just so that you know when you look at this diagram, the top red one here, and I'm gonna kind of run the highlighter over a little bit here, is not necessarily an extraocular muscle, but it's kind of part of the bunch. And from top to bottom, the we've got the superior oblique in yellow, we've got the inferior oblique that kind of wraps around, and we're gonna talk about how that works. Uh, we've got the superior rectus in purple. We've got the medial rectus in pink. And you can see that the uh, lateral rectus here in green has been cut just so you can see that medial rectus in pink behind it and the inferior rectus at the bottom. Now, keep in, you know, notice that the words superior, inferior, they're, they're in play here because, you know, the superior oblique is at the top. The uh, superior rectus is at the top and the inferior rectus at the bottom as well as the lateral uh, sorry as well as well as the uh, inferior oblique as well so uh, all these kind of you know these are like coordinates showing you where all the different muscles attach right so the, the attachment site of the muscle tells you uh sorry the name of the muscle tells you where the attachment site is so then you've got all the different actions and this is where i was talking about that memorizing all these different actions are not necessarily going to be uh, something you're going to want to spend a lot of time on. However, it does help you understand uh, a little bit more how these muscles kind of work and contract to move the eye around. And some <clears throat> some tests out there, some optician tests, I'm not sure if the ABO does. I know I have seen some stuff uh, in a NACOR exam in Canada uh, where sometimes they might throw in a little bit of a question here um, as far as the, the action of the muscles. It's very unlikely. However, again, understanding this doesn't hurt. So we'll just look at the primary. Every, every muscle has a primary, secondary, and tertiary action. We're just going to kind of breeze through these a little bit just, and we'll kind of add some stuff as we go. Um, as far as primary action, the medial rectus is adduction. 
Uh, and then the lateral rectus is abduction. So what are those? Adduction means it's turning it away from the body. Oh, sorry, away, not away from the body, but away from the median of the, of the body, so away from the nose, whereas abduction is turning it inwards. Um, and then the superior rectus, we've added a couple, I've just put all the actions here, uh, primary ele pri primarily elevation, so lifting the eye, but it also does a little bit of encyclotorsion and adduction. Encyclotorsion, imagine the eye turning like, um, let me just think of a clock here, counterclockwise inwards okay so the the interesting thing here about the muscles is that we think of it up down left right it's not that simple it can also twist uh that counterclockwise or clockwise motion and of course uh, the uh, in the case of the tertiary action here it can also do a little bit of adduction turn uh, away from the median as well the inferior rectus it's responsible for depression so turning the eye downwards uh, it's also res responsible for excyclotorsion so that would be the clockwise motion and a little bit of adduction as well uh, the spear oblique responsible primarily for encyclotorsion that we talked about turning it counterclockwise uh, depression as a secondary action and abduction which is turning it inwards towards the nose as a tertiary action and then the inferior oblique finally uh, responsible for encyclotorsion as a primary action elevation as a secondary and tertiary it can do some abduction as well so and the reason why the secondary action and tertiary action hasn't been kind of mentioned here for the medial rectus and lateral rectus is that it, the one thing it does is that adduction and abduction in and out. So you've noticed how I've kind of breezed through this and I haven't really, you know, spent a lot of time on it. I, I'll, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. I don't memorize these myself. Uh, if it really came down to it, I can kind of figure it out trying to think of the location. Uh, you know, think of it, <clears throat> it's kind of simple that muscles like to contract, right? And a, contract, a contraction means a pull. So, you know, the medial rectus would be attached on the outside, the temporal side of the eye. So when it contracts, it would actually turn the eye outward. Uh, same with the lateral ra rectus, it's attached inward. So when it pulls, it pulls inward. So we can kind of figure these kind of things out it doesn't necessarily matter to your job. These are just a little bit of tidbits of information so that you can have a little bit of a better understanding of how this all works. But I don't want you to spend all this time worrying about how these muscles work. Unless you were a, you know, an ocular surgeon that was actually doing surgery to try to correct strabismus or any kind of muscle issues, um, most professionals outside of that realm don't memorize this stuff because it's actually quite complicated. And you can see they have you know, primary, secondary, and tertiary actions. You don't want to be worrying too much about these things. However, the stuff that we are that is important to us as opticians, uh, we could talk about right now. So first, the four rectus muscles, uh, they have their origin at the back of the orbit in a fibrous ring called the annulus of Zinn. These are more like catch words, right? Because you'll hear these things and then you have a bit of an understanding of what that means. So just think that everything originates from one spot, well, the rectus muscles at least, and they're all at that annulus of Zinn. Now, the superior oblique muscle originates at the back of the orbit and then courses forward to a rigid uh, cartil cartilaginous, that's a hard word to say, right? Uh, pulley, it's basically a pulley made of cartilage, uh, and that's called the trochlea. So that's the one muscle that's a little bit unique as far as the others. It actually has a little bit of a pulley system and that helps do so, you know, its actions as well. Uh, now, conjugate movements, these are the things I want you to really re you know, hone in on. Conjugate movements of the eye, uh, they represent when the two eyes move in the same direction, while disjunctive movements occur when they move in the opposite, okay? And there's only really one opposite movement, and I put it in parentheses here as convergence. Very unlikely, unless somebody is, has you know, tremendous control over their eye muscles and they can do a, a cool party trick where they could turn their eyes outwards away from their nose. Uh, I guess the only other time that you would have a disjunctive movement is when you're coming back from convergence and moving its, its you know, the eyes back to uh, you know a centered position. So that 
that is another uh, disjunctive movement. But just think when the, eye, the when the eyes move together, think of tracking an object. You've probably seen this during ocular uh, assessments where the practitioner will ask, can you follow the pen, please? And they'll move the pen from the nose out to the outside of the body, back to the other side and up and down. We're actually monitoring uh, conjugate movements here through the cardinal positions being up, down, left and right and, uh, and, and all the way around. Uh, we're testing that the eyes are moving in conjunction, conjugate, right? And that they're doing, that there's no kind of like lapse there where one eye may take off over the other. And then when you bring the pen really close to the nose, the two eyes should be turning inwards towards each other, and that's a disjunctive movement. Now, initial clinical examination of the extraocular uh, muscles involve observing the eyes through the six, and I mentioned it, cardinal movements, ensuring uh, that they're smooth, complete, and equal. Okay, so up, down, left, right, in, and back out. Okay, so those are your six movements, and you want to make sure that the, we call those kind of like smooth pursuits, that the eye is going to pursue the target, and it's going to go through all those different uh, six movements, and it'll do it equally. And, you know, in the case where it's conjugate movements, the two eyes will follow it smoothly, and at the same time, uh, equal and complete. And then when we move it close to the nose, they will have that disjunctive movement inwards, and then that disjunctive movement back outwards to being centered. Okay, so... That's pretty much all I want you to know about the extraocular muscles. Now, let's talk again or now about why this stuff is important to us, okay? So first, well, obviously the muscles move the eye. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when we're studying the eye and we're taking care of the eye that we don't understand that there's muscles that move the eye. Um, I want you to think of that when one pulls, the other one relaxes. Not that this is gonna make you better at your job, but it just, you know, that's where you start thinking of it. It's not necessarily, that you know if you're doing one movement and one muscle is acting they're all kind of always acting pulling and 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 relaxing all in unison and it makes for a really kind of interesting system now eye misalignment can often be due to muscle dysfunction so if you think about phorias and tropias which we will discuss in more detail you know any kind of strabismus any kind of misalignment of the eye a lot of the times it's due to muscle imbalance either a muscle was not properly uh, formed during developmental stages, or maybe there was a muscle injury. There's a lot of different reasons why. It could be neurological as well. However, in the case of kind of muscle imbalance, this can you know result in different types of, of strabismus or eye misalignment. So just whenever you see eye misalignment, the first thing that comes to mind is muscle uh, imbalance or muscle dysfunction. And uh, when you are, it's, you know, very specifically, for opticians, not that we're going to be necessarily every single client that we deal with, we're going to have them pass through the cardinal movements. However, I do sometimes do cardinal movements with certain patients if I find that there's something kind of funny going on. And it's not necessarily that I'm trying to diagnose them with some kind of issue. It's that I am trying to gather more information as far as what their ocular situation here is and how things are working. However, Whenever you're assessing a person when they're reading, you want to make sure that their eyes are converging and you can watch them do it, you know, when they're coming down to read with their new pair of glasses, you want to make sure that those eyes are converging properly. I actually have a specific example of a gentleman a few years ago that had an eye injury that he never disclosed. He had an eye injury, you know, 30 years prior, which a blowout fracture, actually, which we talked about uh, in the, the lecture about the bony, bony orbit where the eye fell through at the bottom of the plate and they had to repair it and it actually messed up one of his muscles. And when he came to converge, <clears throat> excuse me, one eye actually went in the opposite direction. Instead of converging, it would diverge. So he had a di difficult time reading with a progressive lens, which we'll go into detail what is required of you know the visual system to actually function well with a progressive lens. But we actually had to make some major adjustments here to the way we corrected his vision because when he came to read, he would actually get one eye who, that converged and the other one would diverge. So that's a very, very odd and specific example. But there are many patients that can struggle with convergence and that can cause issues when you start using multifocal lenses and different things like that. So of all the different eye movements, I think the most important one for an optician for vision would be to monitor your patient's ability to converge properly. Um, 
that it'll help you as far as troubleshooting if you're ever having issues using multifocal lenses or anything like that. So that pretty much covers everything that I think you should know for about the uh, extraocular muscles. Of course, this is one of those things that if it really interests you, you can dig a little bit deeper and you'd be well served to know more. But for the time being, I think we've hammered it so far. All right, let's move on to the next.